well, um, it's, um, it's amazing uh, to be here uh, this morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's already afternoon. Um, thanks to Times of India um, and other friends for inviting me here. It's not always that you get an opportunity to sit next to two path-breaking individuals. Um, both of them have uh, waged war with their, uh, with their arts. One, uh, you know, a national threat to the community, to being a celebrated author, and the other, seated right next to me, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody who uh, explored his identity and gave uh, Calcutta its first queer arts production. So, ladies and gentlemen, the two path breakers, Nimal Sadat and Shudarshan Chakraborty with me here. It's amazing. Thank you very much, uh, again, uh, the TOI for having me here. Well, we begin with um, our, uh, our uh, guest, uh, as we all know that, you know, we say Atiti Devo Bhava, uh, our guests are like our God in, in this country. Uh, we begin with you and we go to Chudarshan. Uh, from being uh, the national threat to the Afghan community, coming out as the first gay Muslim in Afghanistan and to being a celebrated author, how's the journey been? What is uh, what, 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 what did you achieve out of it? What, what is your, how do you feel now about it, looking back, Nimad? Uh, I'll be happy to answer that question. Thank you. But first I want to say thank you for having me here in Kolkata. This is my first time here. And uh, you said you treat your guests like gods. Well, I was in Pune and I was bestowed the highest honor, which is the Puneri Pagadi by the Sonali. Uh, Lovely. The, so I was wondering if you uh, do something like that too. You we have to put a costume <laughs> here, <laughs> get into the gear. Thank you so much. But yeah, so g getting back to your question, uh, you. Would you like me to basically talk about my transition? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, so I was reading your letter, that letter that you've written, how beautifully you feel in India and your journey uh, from uh, when you were eight months old and you, you traveled to Washington with your mother and uh, being an author now with 450 rejections from the UK and the US agents and then you finally found refuge in India with your arts, which is your calling, your writing. So uh, I, I was kind of wondering, uh, how would you kind of summarize that? How would you, how, what is your, uh, how do you feel at the moment yes. being here in a lit fest talking about that book? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was here uh, in Mumbai uh, on September 6, yeah. uh, 2019 for the one year anniversary of Section 377. Um, I had my launch for the Carpet Weaver there. And the reason why I wanted to come to India, and I wrote a pen, I think the letter that you read, which is why I call India home. I'm originally from Kabul, Afghanistan. I was born in 1979, the year that the Soviets invaded my homeland. But within eight months, I had to leave the country because my father, who had worked for the communist government was um, appointed the ambassador of Afghanistan to West Germany. In 1984, he was called back to the communist government and uh, expected my mother to follow and bring my older brother and younger sister back to Kabul. But my mom belonged to the, the uh, Mamazay Pashtun uh, clan, uh, clan, which is part of the royal lineage. And so the communist taken their land, seized their land, and basically stripped them from power and had no, no place in Afghanistan. So my mom didn't want um, my, me and my siblings to live in a Afghanistan of war and communism. So she took us, uh, kidnapped us and took us to the United States. So I, it's within this vacuum, you know, very tumultuous upbringing and, um, you know, living the Cold War in my household. And I've experienced that, that I've come of age and also coming of age as an adult when September 11 terrorist attacks, when uh, trying to spend my life in the United States as a marginalized minority, trying to fit in, and then it's like my adopted land goes to war with my homeland, and that drew all my identities in flux. At that time, I was a repressed homosexual, uh, you know, as an Afghan American Muslim. I had to try to keep proving myself, proving my loyalty, proving uh, my worthy, and, and, and all those things. So that's kind of where I came from, and then full circle, after my uncle, who was the governor of the Central Bank of Afghanistan, he uh, was a technocrat. He wasn't involved with the Communist Party like my dad and my uncles. But uh, he basically uh, was 
speaking about the corruption in, uh, in Afghanistan by the warlords and other people like the Mujahideen, the people who seized power before the Taliban, in between the communist government and the Taliban, yeah. and uh, the civil war years. And so he basically, when he got shot and killed in San Diego, it gave me the impetus to go back to Afghanistan. So I didn't go back to Afghanistan to come out and to launch this uh, queer revolution there, but it just, uh, I wanted to continue the legacy that my uncle left behind because he was a trailblazer in the community. He, he did not fear, and, uh, and we believed that the person who killed him was a hitman uh, because it was an unsolved mystery to this day. And so uh, that's kind of how I went back. I taught at the American University of Afghanistan as a political science professor, and I was persecuted immediately for rumors that were spread um, that I'm a, a lapsed Muslim and a practicing homosexual. And I decided, you know, I could leave this country again, but the repression that I experienced and what I saw, the LGBT people did not have a voice. And I said to myself, I cannot do this. I have to speak up. This is my calling. This is my cause. If I'm going to write this book, it's not just an art. It has to, it's part of the narrative. It's part of my own journey, too. So that's kind of how I came into the picture. And um, I quietly and secretly, you know, kind of pushed the envelope, put something on social media, met with LGBT people, various coffee shops and hotels. And we quietly uh, did things in Afghanistan, which will be the subject of my memoir someday. But uh, basically, to the point where I was, uh, I, in the end, end of the academic year, I was not welcome back. And then uh, I was fired from my job, and I decided to just come out on Facebook. Yeah, because you were, you were teaching political science in that university. Yes. In an American university in Afghanistan. Which is funded by yeah. the U.S. government. Right. So you lost your job there. I lost my job. And then, so when it came to pressure from the Afghan government, because like, people who were complaining went to the highest levels of the Afghan government. They're like, he's creating facade and fitna. He's creating disorder and harmony. And he's a threat to Islam, and he's a national security issue because... <sighs> Um, you know, all the all he's going to corrupt our youth, and they're all going to go the gay and lesbian way, and they're not going to practice Islam anymore. So that's kind of where I come in. So I lost my job in a management <laughs> school because I organized a seminar on LGBTQ issues. So we share some common stories here. The the the, the you know it's it's inter interesting that uh, such threads and such stories just take change formats but they're in all countries so that's fine um i understand um fantastic i mean that that's what uh, we are we are not yet beyond uh, sexual identities which this forum needs to address uh, through this discussion we are talking about we're still talking about sexual identities and here i am um as i said um, one of the finest contemporary dancers the first one to introduce a contemporary dance festival in, in, in India, uh, Shidarshan Chakraborty is, uh, is, a, is, is a path breaker, as I said, in the right sense of the word. And um, I was wondering, Shidarshan, uh, looking back uh, to positive lives when it, uh, when it all started, and uh, to Ruturongo, men in letters, on, uh, in, in, in a sacred place like Rovindra Shadun, uh, where you would, you know, where, where people in, from the community, for people from the diaspora were uh, ruling it out. Uh, how's the journey been? Because you, you kind of lost your parents uh, in an interval of almost six months. We've been friends for many years, so I know your story. But I'd like you to tell us that uh, we're still at the, at, at the point of sexual identity. We are not beyond it. So, uh, what's been your journey like as a dancer, as an artist? For me, I always have felt through the years, even when I was completely cushioned and comforted under the protected home and my parents, and even beyond when I was all alone left in the world, dance has given me a huge empowerment. And when I look back, at times I think that I look back and I don't feel or talk about my sexual identity because my human identity as a person to lead life, fight odds, ride ahead, has been most important. And that empowerment has been given by my art. So me as an artist, and I'm sure you will feel that, as an artist, I feel the biggest gift that God has ever given us is this empowerment. Not this artist, every person who has the passion and takes that passion as an empowerment to move ahead, which gives the strength to fight. And when I say it, to fight, 
I'm saying not just about sexual identity. We are fighting every day. We are fighting of not doing the way one is expected to do it. We are fighting of social norming. We are fighting not the way I dress. We are fighting not the way I dance. We are fighting not just because I do contemporary. We are fighting because someone else think I should do Bharatanatyam. Someone else think I should do Kathak. Someone else think that I should speak more Bengali and less of English. So this entire norming is something that we fight each day. And if I ever have got any little slice of empowerment that has always been through my art, which I try to help my co-dancers, my students, because I will tell you, beyond the LGBT identity, the human identity itself in today's time is one of the most difficult and one of the most threatened identity where we are always trying to create differences and compartments and we are talking only about polarization. So human relationships have changed. So somewhere I feel that it's not just in one bracket of LGBT, but there is the entire relationship of human, of human, of human beings man, 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 woman, 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 all have changing in this digital world. And so how, what does it make real for you? So for me, the reality has been the biggest anchorage of my art. Fantastic. That's lovely to hear. Uh, let's come uh, to something which is on pronto. We're talking about beyond sexual identities. Um, when you, when you identify yourself, I've been reading a lot of your articles, I mean, on the internet. Uh, I'm yet to lay my hands on the carpet weaver because I, I want to read that book. How important is the identity? I understand that I mean, with all uh, the due empathy that you're the one who started that movement for the Afghan, uh, the homosexual diaspora to come out and uh, express themselves. But how important is the identity of a queer identity? How important is that to you? That, that is very important to us because that's, that's how we go beyond your sexual identity your art form, how important is that for you? I mean, to be identified as the first gay Afghan Muslim to be fighting for the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, this is an ongoing question that especially, this is a very big, very much a subject of discussion right now in India. Yeah. Um, yes. And so what I would say is, you know what, I would, I w I'm an idealist. I would love to live in a world where we could just crush all the labels and not have, uh, we can just all be other. And what other means is uh, whatever it is. Basically mean we can all be our distinctive things. We don't have to be categorized so that governments and other people who want to manipulate us, especially in democratic societies, I mean, these labels are used by politicians to basically uh, get their constituents to rally and to use us as pawns. Or in, in global order, you know, my identity, being an Afghan, being a gay, being a refugee, has been used in terms of uh, the international system, uh, which, which countries will go to war, which will with peace. So this is the kind of things that affect you. But I would have to say, you know, my whole novel is about identity. It's about a clash of identities. It's about, um, in addition to being a coming of age novel, in addition to being a queer literature, in addition to being a love story. And I think it's impossible to get rid of identities in, in these labels. Why? Like, that's what communism, Soviet communism at least, I don't want to offend the people in, in Kerala because they also practice a version of communism that's doing quite well. But uh, what Soviet communism, you can create a working class and there will be no more identities based on gender and sexual orientation and, and nationalism and race and religion and we can all unite. But that didn't go very well. And they created another dogma, which was state atheism, imposing another identity on people. So my whole thing is this. How can you fight for an identity when we live in a world where the issue of LGBTQIA rights is so polarized, it's pretty much half of the world like, is in a world where it's post-gay marriage and majority of societies in the Western world are now supporting full LGBT equality. And then we have 68 countries that are still criminalizing LGBTQ people to death and life in prison. We, how can we not call 
an identity when our brothers and sisters in Sultan of Brunei are now facing stoning for being a homosexual. When in Chechnya there is, we said never again after Hitler went and sent homosexuals to concentration camps. And there are concentration camps in Chechnya province in Russia and people are being tortured with shards of glass in their anuses until they're ruptured and they die. How can we live in a country where there's Sharia law in Iran and Saudi Arabia and many other Muslim countries where the LGBT community is not even allowed to even exist, let alone fight for their own being a legal entity and for gay marriage? Those are considered luxury items. If I did not come out as a gay ex-Muslim, there would be no LGBTQ movement in Afghanistan. You cannot fight for something without actually labeling it. How can you do this? People said, oh, you know, you're being very sensationalist. You're just trying to draw attention to yourself. Listen, if you think you can fight LGBTQ rights, in Afghanistan or in the Muslim world better than I can, by all means, go ahead and do it. But there is no volunteers who are doing it. I'm the first one and no one in Afghanistan has come out to fight for it. So you know what? Uh, this is the world we live in. There's LGBTQ people in Afghanistan that are victims of kill and death policies. Money has been brought into Afghanistan that is allocated for the National Director of Security to go find out where terrorists are is being used by these very attractive, seductive men who will go into online groups to break down the LGBT groups. They lure gay and bisexual young men and they, they promise them the world, they take them on a date, shower them with love, and then they go and dump them and kill them. And I know because I've had two survivors escape these atrocities. I've had gay people in Afghanistan, this democratic Afghanistan, this transitional democracy that the United States and its NATO allies brought to, United, brought to Afghanistan, there are basically uh, get fined, get, get killed, and, and it's quietly done, and nobody actually cares. So this is the world we live in, and, I, and we have to name it. If, how are we going to fight it? Bef we moved the pendulum. Before I came out, the common <clears throat> understanding was that gays don't exist in Afghanistan. They exist in United States and Europe and in Canada, but not here. We don't have gays. And now no one's having that argument. We've had roundtable debates with Mullah, an uh, Islamic scholar, and we're actually debating Islam and homosexuality and finding, like, trying to mediate this conflict. So we've moved the pendulum. With 2013, I faced thousands of curses and death threats. When I launched this novel earlier this year, I got nothing but love bombs from people in Afghanistan. And actually, I would have to say, the unofficial religion of Afghanistan is Bollywood, thanks to actor Sonali Bendry for making my book, Book of the Month. Now I'm considered acceptable. Because it's like, you know, he, he's an infidel, but you know, Bollywood now has accepted you, so he's okay now. So that's the Afghanistan we live in. It's a very schizophrenic society. Seriously. <laughs> Bipolar, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Unless Bengali television, uh, uh, you know, gave me the role of a villain, a parochial villain, nobody f uh, felt I was man enough to play, it, uh, play a, uh, a heteronormative character. Of course, Bala Shishay was different. I mean, I, play a, I still play a sissy husband there, so that's okay. Uh, that's fine. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm bereft of words. No, um, you know, Shudarshan, here is a story of uh, life and death. Here is a story, is a real story of life and death. Here is a story where a man is actually fighting his own religion. Here is a story where a man is actually fighting his own dharma, the dharma that we talk about, our religion, okay? But here, you are fighting a different battle altogether. It's more of occupational hazards uh, and not life and death. But at the same time, you must appreciate, and I'm sure a lot of the Indian diaspora or the Bengali diaspora who lives here knows that the transgender community still faces a life and death situation in the hinterland of this country. They still do, especially people who commute in local trains in, 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 uh, from different towns to come to Calcutta to work and if they're transgender communities still looking for work. You, do you think you are in a privileged position? Yes, after hearing stories of Nemat, of course I feel that I'm of course privileged to be in Kolkata, whether I don't know whether 22 years ago when I did Alien Flower, whether I could do that show in, uh, in Mumbai or in Chennai, I don't know. 
But it was also that I was a completely white page, so I could actually write the way I wanted to. But the question was threat and acceptance. 22 years ago, when I did Alien Flower, and using a style and a form of dance which was not dance, which was not something that you identify as dance. So this entire identity, the way you look at moving bodies, the way you look at bodies, the way you look at dance, look at art, was completely alien. So alien flowers alien in two parallel lines. One was, it was talking about sexuality. Secondly, it was using the form of contemporary dance, which was not Indian. And now, who, who was telling me these things? I got a lot of support from the media, and I always thank the media for this. Of course, but of course. It is the dance community, my own fraternity, who was rejecting me, and who was saying that you are tarnishing the entire cultural scenario of the city, because on one hand, you are talking about issues which should not be said, is very Western. Sexuality is a word which is very Western. We had this poster called Celebrate Your Sexuality. It was shown in Nandan. And some of the leading dance organizations here gave me calls and said that, you know, everything is nice, we support you, but this word sexuality, we cannot use that in your poster. And um, if you don't change it, then we have to approach the government that you don't get the auditorium. So these are the people who are supposed to be the artistically inclined artists. If they reject, what is the perception of art? And on the other side, they were saying that the dance that you do is not Indian enough. It is, like, it is, it is very Western, you know, contemporary. Then again, I always believed in retaliation not by words, but by work. So I did something just four years later, which was called Indian Erotica, Vedas to the Millennium. The journey of the man-woman relationship, journey of sexuality of India, drawing from literature, architecture, um, history, everything. Heritage. Exactly. So every time when I was told that this doesn't exist here, you're actually putting things on your mouth or you know, on the scene, which, is, which doesn't exist here. You know, we are very pious and pure and always talk about gods and goddesses. I always retaliated through something, through my art again, because I feel that, that that's the best thing that I can do. So was the HIV 19 years ago, uh, in 2004, when I talked about people living with HIV. So you know, this entire, as I told this, when I hear you, that threat, at times, threat can be between life and death. And at times, threat can be very simple, perhaps here, just to be on the stage or, or belong to that particular, you know, that belong to a particular sphere of being an artist and not being there. So st still, I feel a threat is always a threat. And still, over the years, the threat of diluted, I have been accepted because I've been performing all over the world. I've been seen in, I've been accepted by the media, by the newspapers. I travel by a nice luxury car, so, so I can just go anywhere with the, whatever dress I want to wear, whatever. But the acceptance has been gradual, and I feel at times it's still, still, it's very cosmetic. I mean, the threat and the hate stories run in the same, more or less same speed, ladies and gentlemen, in all parts of the world, so that's fine. Um, well, uh, before we open uh, the forum to some questions from the audience, um, uh, I'd like to know one thing, uh, Nimath. I'm very curious to know this. You know, uh, your journey from uh, this man who was in a war cry for the community, for the Afghan uh, homosexual diaspora of the Muslim community, to uh, an author in a lit fest, speaking to an elitist audience, I would like to believe that uh, you know people come to an, uh, uh, who come to a lit fest are you know have some kind of evolution. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have been here. Have you? Do you think that you've lost in touch with uh, what you were, what you had started 
as in um, the, uh, the war cry on social media, the movement that you geared, do you think you will lose touch with that, if you could answer that question? Actually, I, I don't think so. I think it's reinforcing it. Okay. I think that what's happened is it's also an evolution. Before was act, my activism, I had to basically use social media. That's how I use social media to create a tsunami in Afghanistan of like queer, uh, a queer narrative. Can right? we clap for him once yeah, for exactly. doing this? I mean, how that's called brevity, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it took a while, but I mean, it basically like it's the whole country was just engulfed for like a week and a half, like in conversation only on social media, not the mainstream media in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the television and newspapers did not carry it. Yeah. Uh, but on social media it did. And, and I worked as a journalist before. I have maybe over 200 contacts in journalism. I reached out to my journalism concept, like, look, this is a big story. Mind you, this is the United States who's occupying Afghanistan for, uh, since not September 11th, post uh, September 11th, and not one journalist was interested in covering the story. And they're like, oh, you know what, Oof, you know, Oh, this, this LGBTQ Afghans, but oh, they're brown. Uh, they're not really, they're, we don't really care about those. So that's kind of the, the dismissiveness that I face. Only until three years later, when um, Omar Mateen, uh, who basically was the gunman who went into uh, the gay nightclub in Orlando Massacre, the Orlando Massacre. and God. committed the, up until that point, yes. the, big, the deadly shooting and the biggest. Uh, largest attack against the LGBTQIA community in the world. Pe 49 people were dead. Absolutely. Yeah. And he was allegedly, we still don't can confirm 100% and repressed homosexual, according to his ex-wife and other types of things. And he was uh, an Afghan, an American, a Muslim. And then I reached out again to my journalist contacts and they're like, oh, well now it's election year, you know, I mean, that was election year. We're going to have Democrats. We're talking about, you know, banning or like, machine guns and assault rifles. And, and Republicans and Trump were saying, you know, we need to stop. Uh, we need to protect the LGBTQIA from Islamic terrorism because we don't want those brown people killing them. But we don't mind if these white supremacists kill LGBT or do whatever. So that was that kind of a narrative. And I came in and I, I shared a different narrative of what it's like to be an LGBT person living under Sharia law when the, when the majority of your country is against you. The year that I came out, uh, uh, 2013 Pew Research study showed that 99% of Afghanistan believed in Sharia law. So that means under Sharia law, homosexuals should be exterminated. Absolutely. So even LGBT people who are hidden and oppressed and closeted believe that they themselves or other LGBT people should be exterminated. Now that's, you know, we know that internalized homophobia is the story of history in every country. So um, <clears throat> that's the kind of world I live in, uh, that I came of age, and I think that now my novel's doing the petition. I mean, uh, I believe, like, what, I mean, I was an activist artist, and now I'm an artist activist. So I believe that the, this carpet weaver will be the petition to change the world mindset and be a petition in Asia. And the Indian community has, uh, you know, has a lot to be thankful for for having this novel like launched from here to the world because it will be reaching. And I believe what Brokeback Mountain did in terms of a cultural revolution and cultural shift and changing attitudes, and we see state after state in the United States supporting gay marriage after that because uh, it went mainstream, I think The Carpet Weaver is poised and positioned to be that novel to do that. So I am just uh, evolving, you know, I can be, now I can, you know, relax a little bit and have my colleagues such as yourself, you know, giving me the mic and giving me a platform. I don't have to shout from the rooftops. I am able, I have people here who are interested in listening to me, where before nobody really cared. Thank you. Thank you for being brutally honest. Um, well, I think we'll open it uh, up to uh, some questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, he'll, he'll come to you. Um, interestingly, uh, in the American press and media, they portray, not all, sometimes, they portray Afghanistan as a, a garden of Eden for homosexual kids. They're all screwing around. The army commanders all have their boys. They think that uh, it's wonderful if to be LGBT in Afghanistan, the way they talk about it. Actually, can I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's not actually correct. Let's not confuse LGBTQIA with pedophilia or pederasty. The United States media has invited me to speak about 
LGBTQIA, but they wanted to talk about pederasty. I said, listen, you want to speak about, I am, I'm happy to speak separately about pederasty and pedophilia. It's an issue in Afghanistan, but it's an issue all over the world. It's not something unique to Afghanistan, True. okay? And the other thing is that why do we need to l merge and link and confuse pedophilia with LGBTQIA? This is a perversion, this is unacceptable. Pedophilia is a crime against a child, you know, and, and that physical act. It's an it abnormality. Is. When you have a country like Afghanistan that has gender apartheid, where consenting adults, gay, lesbian, or straight, or any transgender, are not able to even have a normal, loving, romantic r relationship with another person that they're attracted to, consensual, and, and they're, so it creates these abnormalities like that. These things kind of happen, these perversions and stuff. But <clears throat> so that's, I wouldn't, let's not confuse that. That's happened a lot where journalists in the US is like, well, well, we'll cover LGBTQIA, we'll give it a few minutes, but you know, we really want to talk about pedophilia. No, I'm tired of talking about pedophilia. You want to talk about pedophilia? You want to read a novel about pedophilia? Go read The Kite Runner. It talks about pederasty. There's many advocates who are specialists about pedophilia now. And I'm, ch I'm changing narrative. I'm not here to portray Afghanistan as this purely barbaric place about bachabazi, burqas, and bomb blasts. I want to show the good in addition to the ugly and the bad. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, the thing is, if we keep showing young girls, uh, like there's a, if we keep portraying Indian and Afghan women as only victims and the white man's coming to save them, and Afghans has this kind of... I, I absolutely agree with you, Nimad, because let's not pigeonhole uh, stories like that. I mean, it's, it's not uh, what the narrative is. I mean, it's, it's, I, I completely agree with you there. My, my character is trying to empower himself. Exactly. And my, that's why I faced 450 rejections. And then after that, when I got an agent here, Kanishka Gupta from the writer's side, I faced of course. several dozen more by publishing houses because we, it's not sexy enough to it's have, not, of course, to of have course. an Afghan person who's like liberating, coming out of the mental prison, yeah. liberating himself and creating a new narrative for his people and for other people around Absolutely. the world. Absolutely. We have a question from the Kiss Me Man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hello, good afternoon to everybody. Hi, Nimad. Uh, this is Abhijit. We have connected on Facebook. I have seen the journey uh, since the time your book came out, you know, in fact, I was one of the first people in Calcutta to pick up the book from a bookstore and write to you regarding this. My question to you is, uh, uh, what has been the palpable change which you have seen uh, way back, let's say, in, uh, in your country, you know, in Afghanistan or in any part of the world after your book came out, which gave you a sense of fulfillment, you know, that uh, the uh, reason for which you had set out to break the shackles, if I can say so, that has been achieved in any way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> well, I, I, I think with our young uh, teenage, early 20-year-old Afghans, what I'm seeing is that they're reaching out to me, gay Afghans and lesbians, that they are coming out quietly to their families in Afghanistan. That is the most bravest thing that anybody can do, really. Th that you could face honor killing by your family. You could face persecution by mob squads, by the state and by the government, and you're still gonna risk it all to come out to, you know, to your, so people are coming out. And they're coming out and they're telling their families and telling their loved ones that they're not gonna marry the opposite sex, that, they're, that this is who they are, and they want their gender identity and sexual or sexual or sexual orientation honored. So this is something that was, that was never done before. I'm, I'm 40 years old, my generation older in Afghanistan, everyone was forced into marriage, and that's, that was the only path. You had no other alternative. So what we're seeing is quietly people are making those changes. There are, even this, the attempt that are being made to disrupt this community, they are still somehow coalescing in, uh, even in an underground movement that's just kind of slowly trying to see uh, you know, whatever they can work with to kind of bring the ch incremental change that they can. So thank you very much for that question. Is there any, un any other question that anybody wants to ask? Any more questions? No, in that case, we will uh, kind of close the session. Uh, I would like to uh, actually thank and request all of you to applaud for both these wonderful men sitting next to me who've uh, been very brave with their art forms. And I hope you will pick up a copy of The Carpet Weaver very soon and uh, meet the author in a solo session at the Lit Fest in a few, uh, in fact, in an hour from now and get it signed by him. Uh, thank you, Times of India. 
for uh, having me on board to uh, anchor or chair this panel. Thank you, Shudarshan, for your time. I uh, want to thank Priyanka, uh, who uh, called me to chair this session. Thank you very much, Priyanka. And I hope you have a lovely session afterwards. With Shudip in the audience, uh, nothing can get more feisty than that. I'm, I'm all eager to listen to Shudip. Thank you, Nimad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Nimad. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I, I really remember, I, I watched this movie, Battle of the Sexes, some time back. This is Emma Stone playing Billie Jean King, the great tennis player who was actually fighting for the equal pay rights back in 1970. And, and while she was fighting, she also discovered something about herself as well. And there, there, it was mentioned in the movie, okay, now there is WTA, which is the Women's Tennis Association. That, that was because of the movement Billie Jean King started. And someday maybe somebody in America will come out as, like they will tell their, like, their sexuality very freely and things will be fine. And we all know Ellen DeGeneres came out and then what happened. So everything has a silver lining. Thank you so much, uh, Nimat, for all the insights. Thank you so much, Rudarshan, sir, and Shujada, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing, amazing. This is the Times Lit Fest, and we are having a great time.